what we're going to have a look at today is a topic as well that goes hand in hand with what we saw last week, which last week we saw about uh, prayer. And so this week we're going to actually have a look at fasting. Praise be the name of the Lord. All right. Praise be the name of Jesus. So, beloved brethren, we're going to have a look at today about the fasting that God has chosen. All right. Because fasting is something that um, is that something is that that we can all do, but at the same time, it depends on how we do it, whether it's going to be effective or not effective at all. And so, our purpose in learning all these things is so that we can have an effective fasting when we offer it up to God. But in order for it to be effective, we need to know what the scripture tells us of how God wants us to fast and what the purpose of fasting would be and do I really need to do it? Um, so all these questions I hope that we'll be getting answered in the study that we look at today. Brothers and brethren, what we're going to notice is we'll read only from verse 5 to 8 first to begin with and we'll see what the Lord says in the scripture, okay? So when we go to Isaiah chapter 58, verse 5 to 8, the scripture says unto us, This was something that God exhorted the people of Israel, because yes, as a people, as a nation, they would get together to fast. So I'm just going to read the scripture and see what the Lord spoke to the people of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. And the Lord said unto them, Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal your bread with the hungry? And that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house. When you see the naked, that you cover him. And that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth as the morning. And your health shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your re-reward. Hallelujah. So we can see here already that the Lord exhorted the people of Israel because you have to remember that the people of Israel as a nation, they also have their set days of when they fast. And if you're one of those people who are serving, for example, directly in the things of the temple or directly in the things of God, like the Pharisees do, they would constantly fast about twice a week. All right. So these were people that would, would, would go for it and do the fastings. All right. So they wouldn't just do a once a month fast. They would do uh, quite a few fastings a week. So you can just get the picture of, of what sort of people they were. But at the same time, God exhorts them because he has a problem with them and what they're fasting and what they're doing. Because when we go back to the scripture in verse five, it said, God asked the question and he says, is it such a fast that I have chosen? So it's like he's looking at what they're doing and he's saying, is that what I've told you to do? Is that what I've chosen? And then he says, a day for a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Because you see what these people were doing was, when the Jewish, by custom, when they would fast, they would actually put on what's called sackcloth, which is a type of garment, which was something that when people saw that person, it indicated and they would understand and say, that person is dressed in sackcloth because that garment would actually mean it would recognize them as someone who is in mourning, who is in affliction, somebody who's afflicting their soul, somebody who is spending a time of... You could sort of say crying on to God and hitting their chest, you know, going, oh, Lord, you know, get rid of all these things in me. And then, you know, whatever the, the, the purpose of their fast is. 
And the other thing that they would do is that they would spread themselves out on the floor from head to toe. All right. So they would spread themselves out on the floor and they would throw dust on their hair. You know, so that was another indication that they're humbling themselves to the very dust, you know, and they would they would put, put, put up the dust over their head. And that was a symbol of them so-called being humble and so-called being, um, you know, submissive to God. So that was a symbol of what they were trying to symbolize when people would see that they're like, yeah, this person is in mourning, is in afflicting of his soul, is in fasting, is in prayer, is in supplication. But yet the Lord had a problem with what they were doing. Because you see, even though they were doing these things, there was a problem at the core of that person or those people. The core problem was at the heart. So then God starts to then say in verse 6, he says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Now he goes, this is what you're doing. But isn't it this that I have told, chosen for people to do when they fast? And he says, to loose the bands of wickedness. Now, what does this mean to loose the bands of wickedness? Because you see, what the Pharisees were doing, what the religious leaders were doing, what the Israelites were doing was they were doing things on the outwardly. But in their hearts, there wasn't any spiritual chains being broken. There wasn't being a, a change of character. You know, if they were a person who was angry all the time or a man who would beat his wife, he would not be changing his character. So really, the whole purpose of fasting was not taking effect how God wanted it to take effect. It became a case of just something that they were doing out of tradition, out of religion. It's the same if I go to church and I come back out and I'm the same person. I've not taken on board any of the teachings. I'm not practicing it. There's no change in my characteristics, in my behavior, nothing. So I've just gone and fulfilled the time and I've just sat down and filled up a chair and all I've done is a, a, a traditional thing that I've just gone to church and then I've come back and I'm still the same person. So this is what was happening with the Israelites. There was no internal change in the person. This is why God then says to them, is it not to loose the bands of wickedness? Because there was wickedness in the hearts of these people, in their imaginations, in the things that they would do. And they were not asking God to get rid of those things. They were not submitting those things which were wickedness in the heart so that God could heal them from that. And so then he also says, is it not to undo the heavy burdens? Because when people are carried with sins, they're heavy burdens that we carry. And so these people were not putting it to God. You know, they were, they were almost like saying, no, I'm a religious person. I'm a believing person. I believe in the Lord. There's nothing wrong with me. So I'm fasting for this, 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 and I'm fasting for everything else except me because I'm fine. But God's saying, no, you're not fine. You need to loose the bands of wickedness that are upon your heart and to undo those heavy burdens because that's what was not allowing their fasting to be effective and to get to God. So then God is giving him the answer and he says, this is the fasting I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Now, this is something that, you know, before we start praying for other people, in a fast, let's just say, I'm going to dedicate a fasting, you know, for this other person. Well, we need to dedicate fastings for ourselves first, because we need to have those spiritual chains broken in us. We need to have those bands of wickedness broken in us. We need to have that change of character in us changed and more like Christ and less of ourselves. So this is what God is telling them, that they need to have every yoke broken within themselves they need to let the oppressed go free so the things that they're doing in oppression to other people things that they are mistreating other people they need to let that go they need to you know let the oppressed go free in other words stop doing that to other people because it wasn't pleasing the lord because that let the oppressed go free if, if we're oppressing other people if we're mistreating other people then really what's happening is we're not displaying the second greatest commandment, and that's love your neighbor as yourself. So all these things God was telling them. And in verse 7, he says, Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry? So forgetting, remembering about the poor. 
And he's saying, and that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house. When you see the naked, that you cover him. And that you hide not yourself from your own flesh, meaning that you're not going to hide yourself from your family, from your brothers in Christ. Because there's people that do that as well. Hey, the pastor's coming. Close the doors. Tell him I'm not here. Because they don't want people to see what you're doing in, in the private, you know. So these are things that God was saying, don't be doing those things. And he was telling the people of Israel how he also reminds us because we're seeing um, how God wants us to do a, an effective fasting, right? And when he gets to verse 8, he says, then, see, he puts a condition. He goes, then, when you're doing it the right way, then your light will break forth as the morning, and your health shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your re-reward. So this, in other words, means then you will see the glory of God. That's when you're going to have your answer. That's when you're going to see the glory of the Lord. You're going to get um, an effective uh, fasting that you've done because God will be in that. You know, if there's problems with your health and you've been asking God about your health, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, whatever it is, then you're going to get your response Amen. from the Lord. Because when we're doing it in the way that God shows us to do it, that's when we're going to get the results. Praise be the name of the Lord. Amen. And this is why when we look at these scriptures, we see that God tells us how he wants it to be done. All right. Because there are some people, and I'll give you some examples. Sometimes there's been a person who, you know, might be fasting and they'll put some time aside for fasting. But then there's an emergency that comes up and they don't want to attend to that person, even though it is a legitimate emergency. And they go, no, sorry, I can't because I'm fasting. It's like, well then, then what's the fasting for? What's the purpose? What are we doing? You know, if we're not helping our brothers out. So yes, I can still go in my fast and I can go and help somebody if it was an emergency. Mm. All right. But the thing is that there are people that do that. It's like they'll lock themselves away in fasting and it's like, yeah, fair enough. That's okay. But if the occasion comes up, then yeah, we, we are called to help people out. Otherwise, what's the purpose of our fasting? How are we asking God to help us draw closer to him? If God puts it back to us and says, love God above everything and love your neighbor as yourself. But yet if we're denying, neglecting our brethren when they need help, then what are we doing? What is our fasting for? What is the purpose of why we're fasting? So all these things makes us think about it, really. Because at the end of my fasting also, let's just say I didn't get a phone call, but at the end of my fasting, if somebody then comes up to me and, and says, look, you need to do this, or I need, I need some help with that, and we're not helping that person, then what was the fasting about? What were we asking God to do in our lives? How is there a change in our lives? So these are things that we need to take on board and, and really understand them. Because now, let's look at verse 6 and 7 on this same thing. Because we, you know, when, when it says here, in all this, we are missing the point. When God then tells the people through the prophet Isaiah, what is an acceptable fasting? And we just saw that, yeah, that we've got to break every yoke, release the bands of wickedness, let the oppressed go free. This is the whole purpose of why we're spending time in prayer and fasting or why we spend time reading the Bible, because we want God at the end of this to change us and to make us better people, less of ourselves and more of Christ, less of our flesh and more of the spirit. That's the whole purpose. So when we then look at first, uh, verse 9 and 10, he also says, Then shall you call, and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke of the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. You see, so this was what was actually happening in the people of Israel. They were fasting. They were doing a, a, a sacrifice, but at the end of the sacrifice, at the end of the fast, they were still pointing the finger and accusing one another. They were still uh, doing all these sorts of things, speaking vanity. And God didn't like that. And verse 10, it says, And if you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, 
Then shall your light rise in obscurity, which is in the darkness. Your light will rise and, the, and your darkness will be as the noonday. So that's telling us that whatever darkness was in us, God will change it into light because he will get rid of that. He will help us with that. But we've got to submit that to the Lord in prayer and in fasting because there are things that we need to bring to God in prayer and fasting. So now that that's been said, let's have a look at what sort of fasting God does not receive. All right. Let's look into that. What sort of fasting does God not receive? All right. Now, for those of us who know the scripture, we know that the scripture tells us about how there was a man who wasn't a Pharisee, but there was a man who was a Pharisee, supposedly a religious leader. And he would go up to the Lord and go, Lord, I thank you for, you know, because I'm not a, an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not like this man. I'm not like this man back here. You know, I tithe and I give uh, uh, things to the poor. I give things to this one, to that one. And I um, fast twice a week. So it's almost like he was putting like a resume to the Lord, you know, to try and justify himself. So it's almost like a checklist. Yep, I'm clean because I did this, this, this. The other one, the one that you see behind him, he recognized that he was a sinner. He recognized that he's nothing without God and that there's nothing really he can do to win God's favor except come to the Lord and just say, Lord, I, res I recognize that I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me and give me strength to do the right thing. Whereas the other way had a completely different heart. The other one was like, I'm all right. I'm clean, not like this guy. And so he was pointing the finger <laughs> as well, even in his prayer, trying to justify himself. So let's look at the fast that God does not receive. When we look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18, it says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their re reward. You know, this brings me back to uh, an example that I can use. I remember when I was working, and I was working um, in uh, the, the place where I used to work, for example. Foxtails was where I used to work at. And I remember when I was at that place, there was the time of Ramadan. You know, the time of Ramadan is the time when the Islamic people of the Islamic faith, they do a one month fast. Okay. Now, this is not something that I'm generalizing because, you know, I can't say that everyone is like that. No, it was just this one example that I'm trying to give you. But there was this one young fellow who was there and he was supposedly doing the one month fast, you know. And so he was doing it during the day. But then, you know, he had this face on, like he looked a bit pale and he was like doing his work like he was not himself. And when everybody would come up to him, they're like, oh, why are you look, you're looking a bit different today? You're looking a bit pale. And he goes, yeah, I'm fasting. Oh, OK. OK, sorry. Yes, Ramadan, I'm fasting. So he wanted everybody to know what he was doing. And so it's almost like it's like, oh, you holy man or you holy woman, whatever, you know. So God is actually saying in the scripture here, he goes, when you fast, don't be as a hypocrite. It says of a sad countenance, like put on a sad face, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. And he goes, verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. So in other words, if people think of that person, oh, you holy man, you this and that. All right, that's your reward, but you're not going to get a reward from God. And then he says in verse 17, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. In other words, don't let people know you're fasting. Don't go and sound a trumpet that you're fasting because that's between you and God. All right. Now, sometimes people will find out you're fasting, but not because you're going and making an announcement yourself. You know, or if people go to you, oh, what's wrong with your face? Because, you know, we purposely don't wash our face because we want people to know that we're fasting. So we can say, oh, yeah, I'm fasting. Oh, really? How many days are you on now? Oh, I'm almost at the 30 days. Wow. <laughs> you know, that's the stuff that God doesn't want us to be doing. OK, so um, that's a private thing between us and God. We bring it to God in private and he's going to bless us and reward us in public. OK, so that's how an effective fasting works. And that's why God is that's why Jesus was saying, but you when you fast, anoint your head, you know, so fix yourself up. And uh, and he said, and wash your face, you know, 
And then in verse 18, that you appear not unto people, not unto men that you're fasting, but unto your father, which is in secret. And your father, which sees in secret, shall reward you openly. Amen. All right. So this is how we start to learn uh, how God wants us to fast and how God doesn't want us to fast. All right. And uh, when we also look at Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 14, he also tells us there. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He said, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, because there was somebody standing right there behind him. And he goes, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes onto heaven, but he smote upon his breast, upon his chest, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. But our heart must be clean before God. You know, we, when we fast, that is to say, without fighting, without anger, without contentions, etc. All right, so when we come to fast, we need to already clear those things up with our brethren, with our wife or our husband, with our children. We need to be right before the Lord when we come to fast. Um, because the scripture says in Joel chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, he says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, Turn you even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. So you see, he's telling us that we need to give all of our heart to God. So this means that if there are still some unfinished things that we need to sort out with other people, then we need to sort it out with them. Because you see, when we're coming into fasting and prayer, when we're actually doing a fast, we're opening up a spiritual door. And this is where it can get a bit tricky with other people because when there's people who don't want to give up sin in their life and they want to be fasting, supposedly to get advancement in the spirit or something, depending on what they're fasting for, there's a spiritual door that's open. And if we're not right before God, then other things can get in. And people can end up worse than what they actually are. And that really does happen. So the Lord says that we need to turn on to the Lord with all of our heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Verse 13 says to us, and rend your heart. In other words, rip your heart. Because, you know, in the olden times, the Jews, what they used to do, apart from having that sackcloth on, apart from throwing dust on their hair when they were in fasting, they would also rip their shirt to indicate that they're torn. That was something to indicate, but it wasn't that they really did it. So God is actually going further in and goes, let the tearing be in your heart. Mm -hmm. Let the spirit of our, our human spirit, you know, maybe it might be a prideful spirit, an arrogant spirit, a stubborn spirit. That needs to be torn so that the real Holy Spirit of God can take over and control and really start blessing our lives. So it says, rend your heart, not your garments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So when we do it in the way that God is telling us to do it, then God will receive it. That's the point of all of this study, that we want to have an effective fasting and prayer so that we, when we come before the Lord, he will do with us what he will do with us and we will get results in the prayer and in the fasting that we do so there was something else you know jesus also said that we have to fast you know jesus actually said we gotta fast as a christian it's a christian duty just as it is to pray it's also a duty for a christian to fast to sp spend some time in fasting because jesus uh basically said that it was for all believers when we look at matthew chapter 9 verse 14 and 15 the scripture says to us here as an example in the time when jesus was with his disciples they said then came to him that's to jesus the disciples of john saying why do we 
All right, so these disciples of John are the disciples of John the Baptist. Because they, they took notice on something that was happening in the disciples of Jesus. And they said, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples fast not? Because they were seeing that, hey, we fast. Why are Jesus' disciples not fasting at all? And Jesus responds and said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? So in other words, Jesus was telling them the whole purpose of fasting is to get closer to God, is to have more encounters with the Lord. And he goes, how are they going to fast when I'm right here? When they're seeing the manifestations of the Lord, when they're seeing the, the, the dead raised up, when they're seeing the kingdom of God right there, who was with them. But then Jesus said, but the days will come when the bridegroom, talking about Jesus himself, because he's the bridegroom, so he's the groom, but the church, all the believers are the bride. So that's normally what happens, yeah? Because when somebody's going to get married and there's going to be a unity between husband and wife, one of them is usually waiting. And then the other one comes. And then they have the ceremony and they unite in a, in a matrimony. So he describes it as a matrimony. He goes, when I'm with them, there's no need for them to, you know, fast and not have food. But there will be days when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then they shall fast. All right. So this was something to everybody because Jesus is not here with us in his in his glorified body right now. But there is a time where he will come back. So right now that is not here. Yes, we fast. But when he then comes back and we are in that unity with him, as the church will go and be in that unity with the groom, then we won't need to fast in heaven anymore. Because the purpose of fasting is for different purposes here on earth, for our spiritual life, for the church, for other reasons. There are many purposes which we're going to have a look at very soon. But this is the whole reason why the disciples were not fasting at that time. But Jesus said, when I get taken away from them, then they'll fast. And we see in the scripture that they did. In you know the book of Acts, it shows the fast that they would do. Paul wrote about it as well, how he would fast often. And these things are all necessary for every Christian. So now let's look at something very interesting as well. Because we're all like, oh, all right, well, I, now that I know I need to fast, Jesus said it. How do I do it? Well, you should know there are different types of fasts. There's different types of fastings. Usually the Bible describes to us three main points. All right. So point number one is a normal fast, what's called a water fast where people don't have any food, but they do just have a bit of water. We're not talking about, you know, having your two liters of water a day or whatever it is. It's just you're having a bit of water because your purpose is that you're fasting. Your purpose is that, yes, you're trying to afflict your soul so that your flesh can go down and that the spirit of the Lord can come up. So for that, you need to afflict your soul. And this is why the fasting takes place of denying ourselves of food and water. But in this fast, the normal fast, we just deny ourselves of the food and we have a little bit of water. Okay, so that's this normal fast. And we're going to have a look at some scripture as well to back us up with that. There's a second type of fast, and that's a partial fast. Now, the partial fast is where, yes, you can have a little bit of food, but you're not going to have the same plate of food, the same portion that you usually have. You're going to deny yourself of specific foods and you're just going to eat like a small, small portion. Yeah, it's just enough to keep you going, but it's not going to be the same portion that you usually eat. That's what's called a partial fast. OK, and then you've got a third one, which is going all out the absolute fast. So that one is no water, no food at all. OK, so these are three fasts that we can see examples of it in the Bible as well. And before I jump on to the biblical examples, I want to just mention to you why God has left these fasts as well. All right. And why we're going to see them in the scripture. I'll tell you why, because somebody who suffers medical reasons, like as a diabetic, for example, if they go without eating certain foods or having like some sort of sugar and their sugar levels go down and they're all like, nah, but I'm fasting, they could actually kill themselves 
because they need their sugar levels to go up. So that's why they would not sort of do an absolute fast where they're not eating food or water. But they could do one as a partial fast where you know they deny themselves of the normal food intake but they can still fast doing a partial fast. And when it comes to other people that might have problems with, um, let's just say their kidneys where they need to have you know, constant water, they could do a fast, do it as a normal fast, a little bit of water, because God doesn't want us to damage our bodies in the process, but he does also, you know, it is a process of us humbling ourselves before the Lord. And then if you're perfectly healthy and fast, you know, if you're perfectly healthy and everything, then yeah, go for the absolute fast. Just look after yourself too, though. You know, when you're doing an absolute fast, it doesn't mean you've gone for a whole day without food and then you're going to go straight for a barbecue and something really heavy because then that's going to damage you in the long run. It will. So what you're going to do is you're going to have a salad, something light to go through your body because you haven't eaten or drank all day. And you're going to start with water, not with Coca-Cola, because that's just going to destroy your insides, your intestines and everything. So this is why we've got to be wise about how we fast as well. Yeah. Because otherwise, physically speaking, we could destroy our body if we don't do it properly. But God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to be wise about it. But that's something that, yeah, we can talk about in, in future. Yeah, because there's people that have made so many mistakes with this. And I've even done it myself, you know. But I thank God he gives us the wisdom to come out of those mistakes. And then go, no, I need to sort it out and do it the right way. Because otherwise, I might not feel the impact now. But when I'm 40, 50, 60 years old... Then I'm going to go, oh, why didn't I look after myself when I was younger? You know, when my aches and pains come upon my bones and my shoulders and everything, then I'll be like, yeah, I should have looked after myself, but it's too late then. All right. So this is all about being wise about it. And that's what God gives us wisdom in his word. So let's look at these three types of fastings. The first one is the normal fast. All right. So where you drink only water. When we look at Matthew chapter four, verse two, and also look at uh, Luke for two, we see here that Jesus, when he did fasting, the scripture says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, so this was Jesus, remember that the Holy Spirit, after he was baptized in water, the Holy Spirit led him to the desert. And he was led to the desert in a dry place. And it says, and when he had fasted there 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. Now, it uses that word, he was hungered, because it doesn't say he was thirsty because even though he was in the desert, the first thing you want to do is drink. Okay? But it says he was hungered because he was denying himself of food. This is why when the tempter came, the devil, remember in, in, in these same verses, he also says the devil goes to him, If you are the son of God, convert that this, make that this stone be turned into bread. Because he was hungered. That's why the devil came to tempt him that way. He wasn't of thirst because he had... He had it with water. But let's look at another verse. Luke chapter 4 verse 2. Being 40 days tempted of the devil, once again, same scenario. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. All right. So this is an example, once again, that yes, we can use water. But because it's a fast, we're not going to be, you know, juggling down two liters of water, three liters of water to try and replace our food intake. That's not the purpose either, because then we're, we're sort of taking away, we're just replacing food, like uh, solid food with, with liquid water, and we're just trying to do a replacement. So it's not really a fasting anymore. So it's a little bit of water to sustain yourself from those acids that will often fall, you know, and it has something to fall on. Otherwise, we're going to be damaging ourselves with the acids that are falling in our stomachs. That's why people sometimes get ulcers and things like that internally because they've not looked after themselves in that sense. So, brethren, that is an example of the water fast. But there's a second one, which is the partial fast. When you abstain yourself or you deny yourself from certain foods. Okay, and that's what I was saying before. So that's first of Kings chapter 17, verse 6. We can look at some examples here. All right. And when we look at the examples, we'll see here, it says, this was an example of the prophet Elijah. When the prophet Elijah went on a very long trip, it says, the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning 
and bread and flesh, as in food uh, or meat, in the evening. And he drank off the brook. So he was in a place where he didn't have food. By force, you could sort of say he was in fasting. But at the same time, God would look after him and he would bring him food. And he did that by a bird, like a raven, who would come and it would drop some food. But as far as water goes, he would get water from a nearby brook of river that, that was there. And verse 13 says, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as you have said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for you and for your son. So in this case, I use this verse because the time that Elijah was in, this was a time of famine. This was a time of drought where they didn't have water. And this was the whole reason why he was actually out on a trip because God, he was seeking the, the, the Elijah was actually at that time seeking the voice of the Lord. He was seeking the direction of God, of what God wanted to do in this situation. So when we look at this situation here, in this case, he ended up coming up to a house where there was just a mother and her child. And that mother and her child didn't have food. They just said, look, we're just going to make of the rest, the, the, the little bit that we have, we're just going to make this rest of the food. And then it'll last us, I don't know how long, and then we're going to pass away. We're going to die. Because really, there's nothing else. But then the blessing came. This is why Elijah said, make it for me first. So can you imagine that? <laughs> he says to a mother and her child, he took their food. Obviously, they gave it to him. But then that's why they were blessed. Because even in the middle of all that, this woman was willing to give him, a man of God, the food instead of her and her child having it. And that's why God blessed them. Praise be the name of the Lord. And look at Daniel. Daniel in Daniel chapter 10 verse 2 says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. So when he says mourning, he was actually not just mourning, but he was actually in fasting. And the scripture also says in verse 3, I ate no pleasant bread. Neither came flesh or when it says flesh, it means food or, or especially meat, nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So when it says I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh. So he was doing a partial fast. He would eat certain foods, but not of everything that he would normally eat. So he cut out the bread, he cut out the meat, he cut out the the grape juices that he would have, he would not anoint himself. You know, usually it was a common practice that Israelites, what they would do instead of putting gel on their hair, they would put olive oil and they would anoint their head with oil. That's what they would do. So that's why he was saying, I wouldn't anoint my head with oil. I wouldn't do this, 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 this. So he was denying himself for three full weeks of the food that he ate. And that was only a portion that he would eat and not everything else. And this was also the chapter where you see that um, he had a great revelation from God. This was the great uh, uh, thing that, that happened. Remember, this was when, when the angel came and spoke to him and says, you know, for three weeks, for 21 days, the prince of Persia withstood me, but I have come, you know, to reveal to you the vision. So these are great things. There was a great battle that was happening, spiritually speaking, when he was in this three-week partial fast. But the Lord mentions the, the fastings for us so that we can learn, you know, that it's not just one way of doing it. There's a few ways of doing it. And we've seen these. But if we have a look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, it also says there, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and uh, a leathern girdle about his loins, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So remember, John the Baptist was also the... the he was the prophet that was known as the prophet that cried in the wilderness, the one that God used to prepare the way for when Jesus would come. And what we need to understand here is that when John was out there, he wasn't just out there crying in the wilderness. He was in fasting. He was in prayer. He was in seeking the Lord. But yet it clearly says what he would eat. It says he would eat uh, locusts and wild honey was the type of food that he would eat. All right. So he was limited as to the food he would eat because also, you know, he was out there in the wilderness. 
Praise be the name of Jesus. So now let's look at the third type of fasting, which is the absolute fast. Now in the third fast, this is done with no water and no food at all. All right. So there are some biblical examples there, but I might not get to go through all of them, but let's just go through a few. These biblical fastings of not having any food or water. Let's look at what happened in the case of Esther. Now, for those who have read the book of Esther, remember that there was a time when the entire Jewish population was going to get killed off on a specific day. And that was by law. All the other nations would turn against the Israelites and just kill them off and take their belongings, their houses, their businesses, everything they had. And that was permitted. So these people, what they did, Esther sent out a message because she was queen at the time. She sends out a message to everybody that they fast for three days and three nights, not to have any food, not to have any water, because the purpose there was that God give her grace before the eyes of the king so that when she goes before the king, the king can hear her petition and not kill her. Because it was also illegal for the wife of the king to come before him if he had not called her. So let's look at what happened here. It says, she said, go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan. Shushan was the capital city of um, Babylon at that time, in the time of the reign of the Persian Empire. And it says, and fast for me, and neither eat or drink three days and nights. And it says, I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So she was willing to put her whole life on the line. So that pretty much talks about what God was saying. Rend all of your heart. So she put her life on the line for this purpose of what she was asking God. And she goes, and then I'm going to go into the king. If I perish, it's my time to perish. But I'm going to trust in this that I'm doing for the Lord. And if God wants to see us out, he will. So we see a clear example there. Because, you know, when also we know about how that ended up you know when she went before the king the king extended out his scepter received her she invited him to a banquet and the whole scenario turned around god saved the people of, of of the jews because they sought the lord so we can see here that there's effective fasting that's done ezra chapter 9 verse 3 it says and when i heard this thing this was ezra all right, because Ezra was a scribe. He was like a doctor, a teacher of the law, somebody who explains the law of God and, and discerns it. He, he explains it to people. But there was a problem happening when he was back in his home nation. And he goes, when he saw that people were doing the wrong thing, like they were intermarrying, people didn't really care much about the law. Even the Jewish people couldn't even talk their own language properly. So when he looked at all of this and he saw the disorder in their own country, in the Jews, he said, when I heard this thing, I rent my garment. So it's an indication that it's like he was, he's sad. It's like he's torn apart. And he goes, and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and off my beard and sat down astonished. He's like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this because remember, Ezra was a scribe. That after 70 years that this whole nation was in Babylon as slaves and God, by his mercy, brought them out. He touched the hearts of the king and the king wrote letters and he says, those of you Jews who want to go worship and build your temple, go. I'm giving you money. I'm giving you gold and everything. God gave them the door and now here they were, not caring about God's things, not caring about the law, about the language, about nothing. And that's why this man who knew the word of God and especially coming out of 70 years and all of that, they were like... I can't believe this is going on. What sort of people are we? You know, and this is why he was astonished about it. But anyways, the scripture then says that he also, um, you know, gets into fasting and into prayer. But there's one important one that I want us to notice. This one about Moses. Because, you know, people often think, you know, that naturally speaking, we can't go for about 19, 20 days at the maximum. Yeah, by science, at the maximum, without food and without any water, people will die dehydrated because, you know, we can go out without food for longer. But with water, we dehydrate, we die off. So roughly it's about 19, 20 days that they give it um, before anybody can die. But here we've got a case of Moses 
who went for fasting without food and without water 40 days and 40 nights. So we say impossible. Exactly. It is impossible. But there's nothing impossible for God, is there? Because this fast that he was doing was directed by the Spirit of God. Because remember, he was up in the mountain when he was doing this. And he would hear the voice of God. He was receiving the law of God at the time. The instruction of God. So that's why the Lord said in the scripture, and, and that's why the Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he was up there in the direction of God, fasting in the direction of God. So this wasn't a fast that he got up there and he says, Lord, I'm going to give you 40 days fasting. No, this was something that he was inspired to do in the spirit. Because God was going to bring the law down from heaven and give it to him so we can have it here on earth. This was a major event, brethren. And that's why God did it in a way where he was sustaining his life so that he could do 40 days and 40 nights with no food, no water. Amazing, isn't it? But that's the amazing God we serve. That's why it says here, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So this was a massive event that was going on there. And then when we look at Jonah, remember Jonah the prophet? He didn't want to go and tell the people of Nineveh that God was going to destroy them for all their sin. But eventually when he went, he told them. And then the people of Nineveh, who were you know, not of Jewish nation, they... Look at what they did. So the people of Nineveh believed God because Jonah said, in 40 days, God is going to destroy you all for your sin, this and that, here and there. And they believed the word of God. So that's why the scripture says, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. When we go to verse six, for the word came on to the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and he covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying let there neither man nor beast look at that even the animals couldn't eat food or drink anything there's neither man or beast herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. So in other words, there was a real repentance. God saw that there was a change in their heart, that they truly were going to separate from sin, and they did. And then so God said, I will not destroy them anymore. Amazing, yeah? So these are the effectiveness of fasting and prayer when we do it in the direction of God. So now let's look at something else, brethren. Why do we fast? What is the purpose of or the motive to fast. So now that we've seen a bit about effective fasting, what God likes, how he doesn't like it, let's look at some purposes or some reasons. We already saw from the beginning, yeah, when we first came in, in Isaiah, that God was saying that we need to break the chains that we have in us. We need to deal, we need to ask God to, you know, deliver us from certain things, characteristics that we have that are not right before God. But I'll give you some examples here. And these are biblical as well. Like, for example, these are purposes why we fast. One, for discipline. Because we as Christians need to be Christians of discipline. Two, to seek God's will in a matter. To receive a response for something we want to do or for God or uh, to make a decision on a direction we are to take. So let's just say sometimes there might be a decision that we're going to take and we're like, all right, I'm going to go and live in uh, another country. You know, I don't like Australia anymore, so I'm going to go and live in another country. All right, well, do we have as Christians permission from God to go to another country? Because really, that's what a Christian will do. We first ask God because if God has us here, then there's a purpose for us being here in the first place. 
if God wanted us to go somewhere else, then he'll make us known. He'll make it known that he wants us to go somewhere else because he'll fulfill a purpose in our lives somewhere else. But if he's not told us to go, then why would we go over there? And that's why we need to seek the Lord and say, Lord, is it your will that I go over there? Because we need to be right with God wherever we go. Because, you know, there's been lots of cases where people decide they're going to leave the country. They're going to flee from whatever problems are probably there, only to find greater problems over there. And then they come back and they go, yeah, no, look, um, I was all right where I was. I went over there and I lost everything. And now I realize God didn't want me over there. He wanted me here. But now I've got to start again. It's almost like a case of Naomi, yeah? Naomi, um, she was in Bethlehem, you know, in the book of Ruth. She was in Bethlehem, and when there was uh, a famine, she decided, you know, with the family that they're going to go to uh, live with uh, in, the, in the towns or in the country of the Moabites, only to lose her husband, two children. She came back without any of them. And... Uh, it wasn't the purpose of the Lord that she be over there in that in that time. Now things could have worked out differently, yes, because we also have to consider Ruth came back. That was that was something that was planned in the Lord. But we got to remember that God will use all of our situations for the greater good. But would she have lost her husband, her children, if they would have asked the direction of the Lord? It could have definitely have gone a different way. But that's why we need to seek the Lord's advice. In direction so point number three intercession you know King David fasted before his son died shows us that we can intercede for somebody else obviously in in the case of King David's son his son still died because that was the decree of God he said you've sinned so your son is gonna die and he did but yet David interceded in fasting and in prayer which is not something wrong to do it's correct to do it but the thing is that in King David's case, it was, a, it was a failed case, in other words, because God wasn't going to listen to him. But when there's other situations, yes, we can intercede for other people. So that's a purpose why we could fast. Point number four, in favor of God's work to excel. So we can, we can fast for the church. We can fast for uh, that God bring more laborers. We can fast that the, uh, the gospel advance to the ends, the, to the ends of the earth. So that's very important as well. Point number five, we can ask for liberation and protection from God, from you know temptations and all that. So we can fast in that direction as well. We can also ask for, you know, point number six, to humble us, that God help us be more humble. We saw those points. These are the main points actually of fasting because we've got to start with ourselves. Those are the points we're seeing about, you know, taking matters to God and all that intercession. There are things that we can fast for other people, but our main point of why we fast should be that God break our chains first. Yeah. And then part number seven, or point number seven, we can fast as part of worship. In other words, we can fast, and the purpose for fasting is to say to God, God, I'm not going to ask anything for me. This fast is to give you glory and to give you praise. That you receive my worship, that you receive the, the praise and the time that I offer here, all for you, Lord. I don't ask for anything. So we can fast in that direction too. You know, because not all me, 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 ask, 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 now, now, now. No, it's we can also give to the Lord, and that's what He wants from us, really. When we have experiences in the Spirit, for those when you know, for those who have had experiences in the Spirit, when when God is doing something in our spirit and it's not us doing it, but the Spirit of God, we will know. That everything flows up to glorify God. It's nothing that we ask for ourselves. It's we who ask for ourselves. But when the Spirit of God takes over, it's all glorifying God. And for those who haven't experienced that, when you do come to experience it, you'll know what I'm talking about. That when the Spirit takes over and we start speaking either in tongues or, or praising the Lord in the Spirit, it's all praising Him. It's not really coming back to us. It's all praising Him. And that's really what the Spirit leads us to do. Point number eight is in times of much affliction, like we saw, you know, in the time of Esther. Yes, they got into fasting and prayer because they were so afflicted that they 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 were like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get killed off, and it's a law. People will not get punished for it. So they went to God in much affliction. So that's another purpose 
why we can fast. Point number nine, to seek understanding, wisdom and revelation from God. Now this comes to, you know, you might be looking at the Bible, you're studying the Bible, but there are things that you're like, Lord, I can't get my head around this. I don't understand it, Lord. So we can fast and seek the Lord and say, God, give me understanding in this point. Help me understand. Reveal it to me, Lord. And God can reveal those things. That's another point of why we can fast. And point number 10, for victory. For example, if you're going through some difficult problems that are trying to shake your faith, you're going through some difficult situations, you can fast and ask God, give me the victory, Lord. This fast is that you may give me the victory so that I don't go backwards in my faith, but that I go forwards. This is something, Lord, Lord, that I'm asking so that you can give me the victory over all these temptations, over all these problems, over all these struggles that I'm going through. And God gives the victory. So these are some ideas for a purpose. Because when we get into fasting, it's not just about saying, all right, I'm going to do the partial fast. And that's it. No, we've got to be praying. But what are we praying about? There's got to be a purpose. And these are some examples of purpose, why we would fast, what we're bringing before God, okay? To get some answers from God and have an effective uh, fasting. Praise the Lord. So, that brings us to the next question. We're almost done, by the way. So the next question is, how long should I fast for? Because now that we've talked about the different types, all right, so do I have to do it for 24 hours? Is it 12 hours? Is six hours enough? Is one hour enough? Can I really do five minutes? So this one, brethren, let me just answer it for you in something that was revealed through Jesus. But for that, let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 109, verse 24. This was something that was spoken in prophecy about Jesus and how Jesus would spend his time. It says, my knees are weak through fasting and my flesh fails of fatness. So what would cause your knees to go weak? And your, like, you know, because we all have body fat as well. But the thing is that sometimes our body fat can start to, to go from us. And this happens when we've entered into fasting and we've entered into prayer because then our muscles get weak. Our, our, uh, our fat that we have within our body starts to get used up because usually, you know, if you don't, if you don't eat anything, then the body starts to have to nutri get nutrients from somewhere. And guess where it's going to get it from? Your muscles and your fat within your body. And that's going to make you feel weak, physically speaking. That's going to hurt your knees if you've been praying for a while. And this is what Jesus was doing for his disciples and for us so that he can win the greatest warfare that he won. He says, my knees are weak through fasting and my flesh fails of fatness. So if you can picture that, taking this as an indication, if I fast and I just say, all right, I'm going to just fast for five hours. But in those five hours, I didn't even feel hungry. Is that, would that be enough? You know, this is something that we have to analyze how we are in the spirit and how God, if he's pleased with it, because it really comes down to, have I really given enough or could I have given more? And you will know that when you come to finish your fast, you will know if you could have given a bit more or if that was up to where you gave before you started feeling lightheaded and that you, you would drop onto the ground. Yeah, obviously we're not saying go to that point or that extreme, but we're just saying, could you have done more? And you will know, and God will know that you know, because in the spirit, you, you'll feel it. And there'll be times when you'll feel that the spirit says, good work, that's enough. And then you just got to end it there. Yeah. So this is something that the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how much time. All right. We only see examples. For example, we see three weeks in the case of Daniel. We see 40 days and 40 nights in the case of Jesus as well as um, Matt Moses. But somebody can choose to do a fast of one day. There's no problem in that. I mean, the, the Pharisees would do twice a week, you know, but it doesn't say how much they would do. Was it 24 hours? Was it? But usually in Jewish custom, yes, it was 24 hours. We know that by Jewish custom. 
that they would do 24 hour days. So if they're doing it twice a week, they would do it two, two days, two days of 24 hours. But it doesn't, so the thing is what I'm trying to say is that there's no set rule to the time. This is something that if you're genuinely offering it to God, then God will indicate in your spirit and you will be at peace about it when you come to end it. All right. But if you've not done enough in your conscience where God will speak as well, you will know that you could have done more and it wasn't enough. So then next time, let's go the extra mile and do a little bit more so we can have that peace with the Lord. Yeah. So that's what this is really about, um, that God receive it and that we maximize the edification that we receive from the Lord in all of this. And when we look at um, 1st of Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, when we look at the advantages, some of the advantages that this brings to us, we're going to see that having a life of prayer and fasting also, when we maintain a life of prayer and fasting, it helps you maintain your spiritual life in a strong state in the Lord. It also helps if you're in a marriage. It helps if you're in a family and against falling into sin. It helps against all these things, brethren. So usually um, people who are Christian will normally have a life like this. It just becomes natural because we know, the under we, we know that there's a lot of things that we need to ask God about. We know that we need a lot in our lives. And we know that there's so many things that we need to ask for that really we're just going to maintain a life of fasting and prayer. I'm not saying that we're going to be doing this every single day, no. But, you know, we would at least separate once a week or twice a, uh, or once every two weeks. And we've got that set and we say, Lord, this is what I bring before you. Break these chains in me. When those chains are broken in us, then we're going to bring to the Lord, Lord, I'm bringing this other life that I see that they're having such a struggle in their walk. Because why? Because the chains in us have been broken. But if we still got things to work on, we're going to bring that to the Lord. We can still bring other people to the Lord because, you know, the fasting doesn't always just have to be one thing we're asking for. It can be a few things in that one fasting that we're doing. But at the same time, we've got to remember that we've got to work on our character first. And that's why we do fasting. And that's why in this verse that we're going to read, verse 3 to 5, it says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So this is talking about a married couple. The wife has not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband has not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud you not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. So this is actually talking to a married couple. You know why? Because there, yes, there have been cases where there's been either the man or there's been the woman that really wants to go the mile spiritually. And they won't even pay attention to the wife for about a month, for two months. And, you know, the wife might be the weaker vessel that needs uh, affection. Or the husband might be the weaker vessel in that sense that needs a hug and all that. But then the other one's denying them of it because they're like, no, because I'm sanctifying myself and I want to be holy and I don't want to be doing those things anymore. So what are we doing? Because if we're in a matrimony and the other person needs our affection as a husband or as a wife, then we're denying them of that. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to start looking elsewhere. So this is why Paul wrote and he says to them, get into an agreement because you are no longer two, you are one flesh. So as you are in agreement, put yourself both a time to fast and pray so that you can grow spiritually, so you can get some victories in the Lord. But at the same time, after you're done with the time of the fast and prayer, in agreement as well, come together again. Have that affection as a husband and wife so that the devil doesn't get in between because that's what the devil does in a lot of matrimonies. And there's been some cases as well. There's been some women that, you know, and I'm not saying it's just about women. Men do it sometimes too, where it's like they're bitter in the matrimony. It's a bitter matrimony. And then it's like when, when people ask them, it's like, well, how long have you, has it been since you've had, you know, uh, hugged each other intimacy? Oh, it's been a long time. And then, you know, one or the other will say, no, it's because I'm, 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 I'm for the Lord. He's my husband or... Or, or something like that, you know, along those lines. And it's like, well, then why did you get married? And it's like, yeah, but that was before Christ, but now I'm just reserved for him. And, but no, we're, we're not, that's not what the plan of God is, you know. 
So the spiritual is spiritual, but also that's why God has permitted us to have a, a wife, you know, and, and for the women a husband, because there's that other part that we need to fulfill too. Otherwise, the matrimony breaks apart, things get bitter, and then people start looking elsewhere, and then the blame game starts. It's like, oh, well, you know, not, not cooking my food anymore, this and that. And so many things come out of that, brethren. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, you know, put yourself into agreement as a couple, Come into fasting and prayer, but you're not always going to remain there. You know, you're going to have the both things, you know, spiritual side and your family side, because that's important as well. All right, so let's look at the results of fasting and prayer. We're almost done, brethren. Results of fasting and prayer. Now, I might not go through this in the scripture, but we've seen the one about Queen Esther, yeah? Her people were going to be destroyed, but God saved them from utter destruction. Paul fasted to receive instruction from God. Because remember, Paul was sent to go and preach the gospel to plant churches, but he wasn't going just where he wanted to. He would get into fasting and prayer and the Holy Spirit would come to him and he would indicate to him, you won't go there, you'll go over there, you'll go here, you won't do this. That's moving in the Spirit. But he needed to seek the instruction of the Lord, and that was through fasting and prayer. Moses, to receive the law from God, 40 days, 40 nights, we saw that already. Daniel, in chapter 10, 11, and 12, he received such a great revelation, even for the end times. He was in a partial fasting for three weeks. Nineveh, we saw that they were going to be destroyed, but they got into fasting and in prayer. So we can see that when you get into fasting and in prayer the way that God wants, there are results. All right? Praise be the name of the Lord. But there are some devils that only come out by prayer and fasting as well, brethren. And so this is a reality that exists even today. This is why a Christian needs to also uphold a life of fasting and prayer. We can't just be like, oh, let the pastor do it, let the leader do it. No, what happens if God puts somebody in your path? You can't be there like, oh, where's my phone? Oh, my credit right now. I can't call the pastor, so sorry, we can't deliver you. We can't cast out this demon or we can't do nothing. No, brethren, we are all called. We've all been given the power of the Lord through his spirit. We just got to work toward it. That's all. Because God has poured out his spirit to everybody. He's not just giving the baptism of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit just to the leaders in the church. He's given it to the church, which is every man, woman and child that has come to be washed with the blood of Christ. But we just got to work on it. That's all. We got to work on our, on our walk with the Lord. Our closeness with God. And so Jesus said in this case, he says, and when they were, we're, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 17, uh, verse 14 to 21, and we'll finish up there. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder. In other words, go from here and go over there. And it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind, referring to that type of devil that was in that child, he goes, does not come out with nothing but by prayer and fasting, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why we know, brethren, that we need to have a life of prayer and fasting, okay? So whether you wanna fit a day a week or once every two weeks, but there has to be fasting and prayer in your life. And for that to happen, we need to fix our life up before the Lord, starting with ourselves. Yeah? Because in order for us to be able to see things like the way we see in the Bible, how Jesus 
cast out devils well jesus was always in prayer he was in fasting we saw an example there where he says my knees were weak because of the fasting because of the prayer and even the the, the fat in the flesh you know failed because so all these things talk to us of the example that we have before us and the disciples of jesus followed that same example brethren and that's the example that we are to follow as well so that we can be effective in our life in Christ and overcome all temptations as well as maintaining a life that's always ready to be used by God in what God wants to use us in. Because a fasting is something that opens up the spiritual door to help us get closer to the Lord in that sense. But we've got to do it the right way. And that is what we've seen in all this study. You know, what God likes, the way he doesn't want it done. So that we can understand that if we put some time to fasting, that we can do it in the right way.